Okay, so welcome everybody to tonight's session um, for Green Christian. I was so pleased to see a, a good turnout here, and I know there'll be more people uh, catching up with it later on. Our speaker this evening is Graham Rowe. Um, Graham's a retired teacher and lecturer who spent most of his career in inner Sheffield, inner Sheffield, Sheffield even, but also worked as a mission partner with CMS in Uganda. Throughout his life, Graham has been a campaigner, as we will see, and he's worked on many issues such as opposing incineration, saving street trees. I think many will be aware of the issues around street trees in Sheffield in recent years, green politics, banning glyphosate, challenging the press, and declaring climate and nature emergencies. Today, Graham writes for two local newspapers and his blog, uh, Tell the Truth Sheffield, is a, uh, as well and he's a carer for his wife. He's also an active member of Extinction Rebellion and the Sheffield Green Party. Graham's topic tonight, uh, as you've probably seen since you've registered, uh, is influencing your community in a time of planetary crisis. And in tonight's workshop, Graham's going to examine some of the campaigns he's been involved in and share what he's learned from them, giving pointers how we can build uh, more climate resilient communities. And I think it's particularly important. Often local politics is something where we can make uh, more of a difference more directly than uh, in, in some of the more far-flung far things uh, that we might otherwise be involved in. Before Graham begins, we'll just uh, begin with an opening prayer, one adapted from the prayer of, uh, prayer of St. Brendan. Let us pray. Lord, be with Graham as he speaks this evening, sharing his conviction and passion for your planet. Be with us as we listen and discuss. Help us to journey beyond the familiar and into the unknown. Give us the faith to leave old ways and break fresh ground with you. Please take this evening and make this time count for you. Amen. Amen. So what's going to happen is Graham will speak um for up to 20 minutes and then there'll be great breakout rooms with a couple of questions as graham's given us to focus on which will be for 15 minutes we've added another five minutes <clears throat> see how that goes and then we'll return for discussion and q a so graham over to you thank you very much thank you david so i'm going to take you through 25 years of campaigning the last 25 years and the first campaign i want to look at it goes back to 1999, um, when my church was involved with something called Impact. Impact was a broad-based community organisation, very much based on the work of Saul Alinsky. Um, what happened was we had a coalition of churches, mosques, community groups, and each of these different groups chose a campaign. And then when those campaigns had an action, they were supported by the other groups and at that time i was the church warden of uh, st john's in inner city sheffield and the problem we identified was that there was a very high rate of cancer in our parish and our church was located opposite a giant incinerator that burnt most of sheffield's waste so a little research soon revealed that incinerators like this produce dangerous chemicals called dioxins. The flats that surrounded the church, Castle Court flats and Harold Lambert flats, suffered from large amounts of dust that were emitted from the site. And the congregation at St John's determined to get this dust tested for dioxins. So here's a view of the old incinerator from the Castle Court flats. I became the chair of a group called Residents Against Bernard Road, incinerator dust and we campaigned to and our campaign involved um, lobbies of the council and petitions and protests like this outside the incinerator and we made allies with lots of different groups such as greenpeace the local residents the green party but we were up against very big and powerful organizations like onyx who are the multinational company running this incinerator, and of course the city council who had awarded the waste contract to them. But then everything suddenly changed. 
Greenpeace arrived and they occupied the incinerator. They climbed up the chimney, painted toxic crime down the chimney, and they put a cap on the top of the chimney. They painted dirty energy on the green energy sign on the, on the edge of the building. And they successfully highlighted that Schaeffer's incinerator was actually the most dirtiest and, and polluting incinerator in the whole of the United Kingdom. Greenpeace were very well organised. They hadn't just done the direct action, they'd also researched very well and produced a plan that show how Sheffield, showed how Sheffield could become a zero waste circular economy without any need to burn the waste. Following the occupation, and of, of course the Greenpeace protesters were arrested, um, there was a big public meeting that I helped to organise at, at my church. Um, and at that meeting, I explained to everybody there how Jesus' resurrection was actually an act of civil disobedience, because in pushing away the stone, he broke the seal and thus broke the Roman law. The current vicar wasn't very happy with all this. Um, he, he, he replaced the vicar that uh, wanted us to join impact. And so the church then lost its momentum, really. Um, Impact went on to challenge things like doorstep money lending and promoting credit unions. They were doing a, a great work. But our vicar wasn't keen on, on impact, so it, it moved away. And I also moved away from the church. Well, that church, St John's Church. So a long story short, Sheffield City Council decided to close down that old incinerator but unfortunately, they replaced it with a new incinerator, which is shown in this picture. The good news is this burns at a much higher and more controlled temperature, so the emissions are not as dangerous as they were before. But it produces heat, the heating system, and electricity, but it is a massive contributor of CO2. And the other big problem with it is it, it, it's a major hindrance to recycling efforts because the council need the waste incinerator to to keep it going so there's no incentive for the council to recycle more so what can we learn from this campaign i'm thought of five things non-violent direct action can be extremely effective if it's well planned and i think jesus, jesus turning the tables of money show money changes shows that you know good example good, good disciples can follow this example when you're campaigning on an issue, it's really important to build as broad an alliance as possible to support the campaign. Don't be frightened to make allies with people that you might not usually work with. Research is absolutely vital. You've got to know your facts and be persistent um, in finding out what is... It, it, in finding out what is not publicly available. So you can use freedom of information requests to find out the information that people don't want you to know. Impact always emphasise the importance of power analysis. So whenever you start a campaign, find out where the power lies in that situation. Who has got the ability to change what you need to change? The incinerator was part of a PFI contract, Public Finance Initiative. So this is something that gives responsibility for council services to companies whose main aim is to make a profit. That's never a good idea <laughs> in my, uh, my experience. And finally, this is sad, but it's true. You can't trust the politicians. They don't always have the best interests of the community or the planet as their top priority. So the incinerator campaign sparked lots of interest in green issues in Sheffield, and it led to a big growth in the Green Party. And I was very involved in, in the Green Party. Back in 1992, I stood for Parliament in Sheffield Central. I was able to challenge politicians like David Blunkett and Richard Cable at the Hustings. 
And then between 1994 and 2016, I stood in all the collections in my local ward, which is Manor Castle, gradually increasing the vote and establishing the Green Party as the firm second place to Labour. So I helped the Greens increase the number of councillors from zero up to 14, which is where we are today. And this was done by campaigning using the strategy of target to win. This means that wards were selected where we knew the Labour councillors were mainly ineffective and unpopular. And we regularly canvassed householders in those wards to find out what the local issues were, and what people were concerned about. And then we highlighted these in regular newspapers, keeping in regular touch with the electorate. I never got elected. Um, I didn't really expect to because Manor Castle Ward wasn't chosen as a target ward. But having a substantial green group on the council does make a difference to council decisions. And that's especially as the council has moved from a strong leader government system, which many other councils have, to a much more democratic committee system, which means that all the, the councils are involved in decision making on, on the different committees, not just the, the party with the biggest number of councillors. And that's the result of a, a, another massive campaign by a group called It's Our City, which, which made a very big petition and, and got the, the council to hold a referendum on how they should govern Sheffield, which was successful. So what can we learn from the growth of the Green Councillors in Sheffield? With hard work, we can change politics in this country, even with our totally unfair electoral system, it is possible to, to change. Even seats that appear very safe for one of the main parties can be overturned, especially if the sitting councillors are not doing a good job. Green policies won't always be popular with the electorate, as they don't understand the urgency of the climate and nature emergencies. The media don't adequately inform people about this, and human nature means they don't like change. Powerful influences from other political parties, corporations and so-called think tanks work to undermine green politics. So this, this is showing the current makeup of the council in Sheffield. It's, it's now run by a, a, a group of Labour, Liberal Dem and Green councillors. We urgently need legislators at every tier of government that understand the planetary crisis we're willing and, and are willing to advocate for it. So in Sheffield, we've struggled with policies like the clean air zone, um, active travel zones and improving bus lanes, because we've met with considerable opposition from the road, road lobby and other political parties and right wing groups. The Green Party strategy of target to win has worked to very slowly increase the number of Green Councillors. However, I believe a new strategy is now required to meet the urgency of the planetary crisis because the Green Party are just not being successful enough to implement the changes that we so desperately need. So let's move on to the Battle of the Street Trees. You've probably heard about Sheffield Trees. How did that start? It was another PFI contract. The council awarded the contract to improve and maintain Sheffield Street Trees to a multinational company called Amy. And much thought went into the resurfacing of the roads and the replacement of the street lights, but trees were a bit of an afterthought. So the problem started with a misunderstanding of the arboricultural term overmature tree. So this is a term used in forestry to denote a tree that has reached the size to maximise the profits from its wood. It's got nothing to do with the lifespan or safety of a street tree. And it was partly due to this misunderstanding that 17,500 street trees were deemed to be in need of felling. And this target, target was written into the contract with Amy. The contract also insisted on straight curbs. Any tree whose trunk had grown sufficiently to push the curb out of alignment slightly was therefore threatened with felling. And the campaign discovered a whole host of engineering solutions that could be used, such as using a thinner curb, like this picture shows, 
or um, using flexi pave or simply removing the curb. But Amy refused to use any of these. Amy blamed trees for uneven pavements that caused the trip hazard. The trip hazards needed sorting out, um, and many trees were felled for this reason. But when campaigners eventually worked with Amy to look at the problem, it was nearly always found that these trip hazards weren't caused by the tree's roots, as Amy was saying, but by many, many layers of tarmac. And all that needed was the careful excavation of the tarmac around the roots, and then the pavement could be relayed without any problem to the tree. So things really started to get crazy when the council and Amy and the police arrived at a road called Rustlings Road in the middle of one night. And they knocked on all the doors and they demanded all the residents move their cars. And then Amy came in with their chainsaws and started cutting down all the trees on the road. Um, people that refused to move their cars had been towed away and two senior ladies were arrested somewhere in the nightmare, the nightwear for objecting to all this. My involvement was as the chair of Save Norfolk Park Trees, my local area, and a short time on the committee of Sheffield Tree Action Groups. There were many, many aspects to this campaign. It was very complicated. There was traditional campaigning, petitions, marches, drama, lobbying of councillors, MPs and council meetings, getting celebrities to support the cause, and even setting up a protest camp. All the threatened trees were decorated with ribbon, ribbons and save me hearts. There was ever such a lot of research and information gathering. So for, for instance, an interactive map was produced of all the street trees that were under threat. And those knowledgeable trees were in very great demand because we had to determine if what the council was saying was right. Some of the trees were in fact dangerous, but most of them weren't. And we needed to find out how healthy all of the, these trees were. And we used something called CAVAT, which is Capital Asset, Asset Value for Amenity Trees, to calculate the value of the street trees. Nonviolent direct action was used. Uh, residents physically protected the trees. They, they got around the trees to prevent people with chainsaws chopping them down. And this escalated as Amy used more, dras more drastic tactics to stop it. First, they started putting fences around the trees. The campaigners either jumped over the fences or got in between the fences. Uh, and then bouncers were employed to keep the protesters out of the safety zones. The campaigners researched the law and they found it was quite possible to stand on people's property where the, the tree over uh, came over onto people's property and that prevented the, the tree falling. And there was even a flying squad of people who um, spied on Amy's to see what they were doing and followed them and warned people where the um, tree felling vehicles were heading. And one day we blockaded Amy's depot. We stopped any vehicles leaving the depot by slow walking outside the depot. But then the stakes were raised even higher because the council took out an injunction from the protesters, meaning they faced arrest and huge fines and even prison sentences if they interfered with the felling. The council lied for many years about the contract, despite meeting massive resistance from very well organised residents. And as you can see from the picture, massive police presence became common at the funding sites. In the end, it was the legal work that was absolutely crucial. The nonviolent direct action was really important to raise awareness and to, to prevent the actual funding of the trees. They, they felt about 6,000 in the end out of the 17,500. Um, but it was the Forestry Commission's work stating that the fellings were actually illegal that led them to be stopped around 2018. And since that time, things have improved immensely. Something called the Sheffield Tree Tree Partnership was created 
So now citizens work with the council to agree any necessary tree work. A new street tree strategy has been agreed and implemented. There's been a street tree inquiry, and this has been published. It's called the LOCOC report, if you want to look it up. And most campaigners have been issued with official apologies from the council. But those who have been found guilty in court are still understandably very aggrieved. If you want to find out more about Sheffield Street Trees, there's a really good book called Persons Unknown. And there's a film which you can watch online called The Felling, which tells you much more about it. So what can we learn from the, the tree campaign? The first five points are exactly the same as the incinerator. Non-violent direct, direct action works. Um, got to build broad alliances. The research is vital. PFI contracts, usually bad. Don't trust the politicians. It's sad to say in this case, that the church played very little role in the campaign, although some clergy were supportive. I really think churches should support community campaigns like this, which aim to protect God's creation. This campaign was remarkable for its size. It covered the whole of Sheffield. It was remarkable for the amount of deceit we had from the council and the massive risk campaigners took to their liberty and their livelihoods. But also, unfortunately, the number of fallouts between campaigners as tensions and stress got the better of them. Not all campaigners have a rounded set of people skills. They tend to have quite many people with quite big egos. And campaigns like this need people with calm heads who can mediate and unite the campaign. So it's really helpful to have Christians involved that can keep a clear head. I don't know if any of you watched Mr Bates versus the post office on TV recently. That's a really good example of a campaign. And it showed how a campaign can take over your whole life and be all consuming. That was definitely the case with the tree campaign. So campaigners need to take a great deal of care of their mental health and support each other in this. And I hope churches can offer people who are campaigning the prayerful support and reflective worship that, that helps them. So moving on to a different campaign, the climate and nature emergencies. In February 2019, I've sent a massive petition to the council calling on them to declare a climate emergency. This followed a campaign by the Sheffield Extinction Rebellion and the council passed the Green Party motion to declare an emergency. But a year later, they'd done next to nothing. So the Extinction Rebellion returned. We had a, a die-in in in the town hall. And we felt it was necessary to actually disrupt the council meeting. We sang songs in the council meeting and they adjourned for a bit while we uh, sang to them. Following the declaration of the climate emergency, the council commissioned something called the Tyndall Report, which presented Sheffield with a carbon budget. We have got 16 megatons for the entire century, which with business as usual, be consumed by 2025 next year, two years away. A 14% yearly carbon reduction was required to stay below the target of no more than two degrees warming of the pre industrial times. Since the climate emerging was declared, we've just worked out that the council emissions have decreased by just 3% in total. That's mainly from changing streetlights to LEDs. To be on target, we should have decreased that by roughly 50%. Sheffield Council continues to justify things like new road schemes and funding Boeing to develop aircraft parts, clearly moving the council in the wrong direction when claiming to make, be making progress on net zero. So we're trying to hold Sheffield Council to a account on this. It's the fifth anniversary of the climate emergency next month. I hope someone's holding your council to account on these sorts of issues. What can we learn from this? That the council needs much more support from government to get to net zero. Councils need to make some decisions that will be unpopular with the electorate to get to net zero. And the question is, how can they do this in a democracy? 
To make climate action popular with the electorate, we must get the media to tell the truth about the planetary crisis. Some councils are making much better progress than others. You can find out how your council is doing at mysociety.org. So the media is so important in all this, isn't it? So in 2019, I set up my other campaign. Um, Extinction Rebellion's first demand is that people should tell the truth about the climate emergency. And I was very concerned that the local press were not doing this. There were regular letters from climate deniers saying that climate change is a myth. So again, we, we got a big petition together, lots of people signed it. And we took this position to see the editor, who's pictured here, Nancy Fielder, uh, and talk to her about it. So the positive outcome of all this was that we were offered a regular column in the local paper, the Sheffield Telegraph, Sheffield's weekly newspaper. And in 2022, we also got a regular fortnightly slot in the Sheffield Star, which is the daily newspaper. What we're writing in these articles should really be front page news, but we are getting it in you know, towards the back of the paper near the sports pages. But it is quite unusual for a local paper to be printing this sort of stuff. It's I think it's a big um, bonus for Sheffield, but we're, we're doing this in the Sheffield Star and Telegraph. And these were two of the, art, the early articles that we got in. What can we learn from this? Well, the media is controlled by those same vested interests that support fossil fuels, but it is possible to influence them. You can use your local papers to get the message out, write to the editor, provide them with articles. Most local papers run on a shoestring. They haven't got a lot of money and they're often very grateful for material you can send them. So if your church is doing something good about the environment, get it in the paper, let them know. But also use your own media, like I, I use the media with my, my blog, Tell the Truth Sheffield. Use the church website, use your newsletter uh, to get the message out about the, the planetary crisis. The council also declared a nature emergency in 2021. This followed a very strong campaign by the Wildlife Trust, Friends of the Earth and the Diocese of Sheffield various other groups. I was really pleased that the diocese got involved in this. They played an active part at diocesan level. And they've also joined South Yorkshire Climate Alliance, which is a very big alliance of uh, one of the 50 groups, I think it is now. I hope your diocese is helping to protect God's creation too. I've read this book recently. I think it's a must read, Silent Earth by, by Dave Gawson. It would be really helpful for churches wanting to improve their local environment. Finish off, I just want to share a few graphs. This is what's happening with the population of lots of different species at the moment. So it's declined by 69%, 1970, these species. This is the latest world temperature anomalies graph. You can see the shear way, way above all the others, 1.4 degrees now, very, very close to the 1.5 degrees we really should be trying to avoid. That graph just shows how exceptional last year was, way, way above the previous years for the temperature anomaly. Last year was the warmest record, warmest year on record. And here's what we need to do to get to the various um, temperatures. To, to keep the temperature within 1.5 degrees, we've got to have a massive cut now in our CO2 emissions. It's not just a transition, it's a, an amputation. Um, and it's looking extremely unlikely especially when countries like ourselves and China are, are increasing fossil fuels and finding new, new places to, to mine. So 
So with climate and nature in such a perilous state, it's time to reconsider everything. It's clear that the cops and the governments aren't coming to save us. We can expect food shortages all over the world, far more extreme weather, floods, storms, wildfires, droughts and earthquakes. There's going to be more of resources and there's going to be a massive increase in the movement of people as they leave flooded cities and islands and drought stricken lands. So my question tonight is how do we begin to prepare for this? How are we going to cope when all these different Graham, do you think you can pull it uh, bring it I to am. a close pretty soon? I'm on the last page. So we're currently on track for an uninhabitable planet. Best interests in the oil and gas industry are extremely powerful and dominate governments and cops. We need to employ campaigns, all the campaigns because we've learnt to combat this. Every reduction in greenhouse gas emissions saves lives. But we also need to accept that the battle to save the Earth from 1.5 degrees of heating has been lost. So we also need to prepare for increasingly more extreme weather as these tipping points kick in, kick in. As in the tree dispute, it's probably legal measures that now offer the most hope for dramatic change in our society. If you're not aware of it, check out the Climate Genocide Act Now campaign, which is using the law to try to prosecute climate criminals. There is a real danger that this situation is now so bad that people will lose hope for the future. The church and green Christians must be a beacon of hope in the dark times that approach. So these are my two questions for you in the workshop. What campaign can your church initiate or support in 2024? And how can your church help prepare its congregation and the local community for the problems the planetary crisis will bring in the next two decades? Over to you, David. Thank you very much, Graham. And that was full of uh, lots of interesting or inspiring stories for campaigns that actually worked despite everything. Um, and we've got obviously important questions to think about. Well, I hope that was uh, productive for you all and you've all come back with questions or, or suggestions. So we sort of, sort of open the floor now um, to somebody, perhaps we won't go through every group because we've got about 20 minutes or so, so we can't go through everybody. But if you've got answers to the first question, you know, what sort of campaign can your church initiate a support in 2024? Either I'll try to see hand, physical hands up or use the, the little hand uh, thing at the bottom, raise hand function. And I'll try and catch you and Graham. Um, well, I can't actually see at the moment. There he is, um, where Graham can perhaps uh, respond. David Shaw is the first hand I can see. David. Hi, yes. I was just saying in our group that um, the church uh, that I'm part of was possibly looking at um, a building project um, this coming year. And I was wondering what our most responsible approach could be to that. I mean, besides looking at using um, uh, climate friendly materials, um, I wondered whether we should be looking to offset carbon emissions or whether actually we can uh, drive a more positive argument in terms of refurbishment rather than rebuilding. Graham, you want to? Um, well, obviously it depends on the church building, but obviously insulation is the first thing to look at. So the panels might be the second thing to look at. Um, and the third thing is probably a, a heat pump of some sort. A source heat pump, maybe to heat the church if you're refurbishing. Um, I'm not a great believer in offsetting. <laughs> uh, if, if you want to offset, make sure that it really is a, a good scheme. Lots of offset schemes are, are planting trees somewhere or other, but these trees may not last very long. They may be in a wildfire. They may, you know, they may not be sustainable. They may be the wrong trees planted in the wrong place as well. So be very, very cautious with any offsetting schemes. But do, yeah, do get good research on how your church can be 
as energy efficient as possible when you're retrofitting it. Thank you. Uh, next one I've got is Columba. You can also put things in the chat, by the way, if you like. Uh, hello. Uh, the, the one that I'm hoping to get involved with and promote this year is um, Just Money. So like justmoney.org is the website of uh, it's Christian looking at ethical banking. And I was thinking if people both at a individual level and a parish level and diocese level would inform themselves more about ethical banking and what the bank that they have business with, uh, what deal, whether it's the fossil fuels or military spending as well, I think we should be very um, sensitive to the fact that banks do, are involved in military spending and we're seeing all this war going on on our screens. So that's the um, that's what I'm interested in very much this year. Mm -hmm. Graham, any? Yeah, vital again. In Sheffield, we've recently persuaded the cathedral to stop banking with Barclays, which is a good thing. Barclays are very involved in supporting fossil fuels and supporting um, armaments in in, Palestine, in Israel and things like that. So yeah, avoid Barclays and HSBC and big banks like that if you possibly can. There are good alternatives. I'm not a financial advisor. I'll put that in quickly. But, uh, groups well, like you're going to follow up on that. Just banks like. Um, Triodus and the Ecology Building Society and Co-op all try to have very ethical policies. Nationwide Building Society as well, throw in. Um, they, they try to do the best for the environment, so do, do check their accounts out. Lumber, a quick is that a follow-up quickly? Or? Uh, yes, I just wondered, does Graham know what bank Sheffield Anglican Cathedral have switched to? I'd be, I'm trying to find this out and haven't had any success so far. Um, there are others on the chat that might know. Um, right. mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Okay, maybe somebody can put that in the chat if it comes to mind. Um, yeah, we did have a talk uh, two months ago with Rosie Venner talking about just money. So those of you who didn't catch that one, it's on YouTube on the Green Christian Channel. So do go and follow that because it was very helpful along the lines that. Columba and Graham have talked about. Sue and Jim Green have got a hand up. Don't forget to put your hand down when you've finished. That's the trouble with these hands is that you, because there's no physical effort involved, people forget to take their hands down. Sue and Jim. Um, anything you suggest always suffers from the, uh, what Graham was talking about, uh, responding appropriately to the crisis you're in. Um, but notwithstanding, one of the things that I was thinking about was, was rivers and water. Around here, where we just moved to Halesworth in Suffolk, um, there is a, a group emerging which is seeking to monitor the water quality in the river surrounding, which is dreadful. Um, the sewage is, is a big problem, which it is obviously nationally. But it, it has the advantage of, of addressing an issue and also, um, I think, have the potential to bring people together and do something creative at the same time. Because the idea would be to have a nice ramble together with people and go and test the water quality and uh the uh, alongside that i don't know how i haven't looked into it how relevant this is in suffolk but i know there we were talking about the fact that in some areas there's been sort of years past where rivers were straightened to make them flow quicker and now it's all changed to to stop them flowing to to, to develop things and, and stop the flooding upstream so whether that's an issue that that because their flooding is an issue here, but it seemed like that addressing an issue, bringing people together, and doing something really nice at the same time does have an awful lot of potential to it. I think that's a lovely idea. Anything that the church churches can do as as a group like that to both help the environment and build up relations in the church, I think is is superb. Um, in Sheffield, our problem is more with the, the grouse moors um, because the, the the moors are managed to for the grouse rather than for the environment. Water comes off the grouse moors very, very quickly and leads to flooding in the valleys. So we need to rewild those those moors. Um, 
but yeah, water quality is also a massive problem. Extinction Rebellion have been trying to get people to not pay their water bills. Um, mm. Not being involved in that at all, but that's a, another interesting one, a bit like the poll tax campaign of old. Ruth, you've got your hand up. Thank you. Yes, sorry, I've put it in the chat, but just to remind you oh. and to say that it's, um, we have a sort of churches project on a plate for you, which is the vigil for climate justice, which is starting on the 14th of, of, of February. And and I really, I'm really happy that it fitted, fitted in with one of your ways to make campaigns work, Graham, by having a wide range of organisations involved. Mm -hmm. So you've got CCA, which is tied to XR and NBA, NBDA, and then you've got CAFOD and the Salvation Army and Faith for the Climate and just everybody really. And we're all working together and it's going to be really great. And so it's something to bring your churches to just bring the people that don't normally don't know what to do about it. they know there's a climate change problem but they don't know what to do about it bring them along to one of these book 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 a slot and put your the name of your church on on this rotor and um and get them involved and even if even if the only person that goes is you you are going with their blessing and they will then have to pray for you and have to pray for the climate and it's a great way to get the whole church involved in climate activism Yes. Um, anybody else? There wasn't a hand up, but it's gone down again. Um, and I mean, we we, I mean, the, the, we can move on to the other question. How can you help your church prepare its congregation and local community for the problems the planetary crisis will bring in the next two decades? I think some of the things we've heard already, both from Graham and, and in just in the comments since, so show that little things all oh, help. I mean, it's a big problem. But little things can appeal to all sorts of different people. You know, some people climbing up a chimney stack is not for them, but getting involved in restoring a river or something like that may well be, and maybe something you can join in other groups, sort of non-Christian groups as well. Anybody else? Oh, yes, Debbie. Um, it, it's uh, it's one of the things that that is missing from uh, from Eco Church's program, and and uh, it, we it, we keep coming back to it and uh, and have. Uh, have alerted them to to a need to in, in, include some climate resilience questions because that's that's a sort of missing thing uh, in the program because it, it's such a good sustainability training in most most ways but um, uh, the flood resilience and uh, extreme heat resilience and th things like that are um, uh, you know are, are such such big issues for quite a lot of churches. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do you want to say anything, Graham? Or no, I think it's not fine. <laughs> keep, keep going. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah, Rosemary. No, I was just going to say we're from Reading, and we've had um, the Thames has flooded, and quite a few of our church congregation houses have been affected, mm -hmm. and we were totally unawares and totally unprepared. And I think one of the things as our church we'd like to do now is make sure that we've got a supply of bricks. So people can raise their furnitures and sandbags. We couldn't get sandbags because they'd disappeared from everywhere. And if we're talking about church resilience, that's something we really do need to think about now. Barbara. Um, just following on from what, what Ruth said, we, we, we are green Christian, that is, are going to try to get more engaged with churches as churches. And you will be hearing from our new project, church project officer, at some point, if your church happens to be a church member, which a few are, and you'll be certainly hearing from from Ruth and I in e newsletters. Um, so, our first project that Melanie is leading is on is the one Ruth mentioned, are trying to get more churches as church bodies as groups joining in this Lent vigil, which starts on the fourteenth of February. And in addition to the twenty four seven vigil, we're also having a big service at St John's Waterloo again which again, it'd be lovely to have bring a group from your church to that service. We were overwhelmed last April with the numbers who came. So you're going to have to book your place this year. We cannot have ourselves over, uh, overfilling St. John's again. So if you can persuade a group to come up, that would be wonderful. And then come with us as we walk to Parliament um, to actually start the 24-7 vigil that will be held. But that's just the start of what we hope will be a number of ways we'll be trying to engage you, help you to engage your church community. Eco Church do a brilliant job of all the practical things that a church can do. 
but we felt there was a there was a dimension that Green Christian could bring in to all our church communities to get get people thinking more about the fundamentals of you know what's going on the sort of crises that we talk about and think about and to get some more little more campaigning going along um you know the lines of supporting them as they want to make a change in their own community and in, and the whole so watch this space you'll be hearing more from us thank you diane first and then judith with my nurse's hat on um thinking about resilience and thinking about church congregations being predominantly elderly, I think there could be a real role for offering some sort of training or health education to, to congregations about dealing with extreme temperatures, mm. um, about, you know, explaining to people how we are going to have more heat waves and things and how they should actually be living healthily through them knowing that elderly people are much more susceptible to heat stroke and dehydration and things and excess deaths so it's just something that maybe churches could try and facilitate yeah that's thank you that's graham anything to sort of say or happy just to go along with that very happy to support that idea yes very good idea going back to what people were saying before about uh, resilience one thing that our group was talking about was um growing food and how some some churches are, are having projects to grow food and as dan was saying many of our congregation are, are elderly and they've got gardens they can't cope with anymore so that land could be used if the congregation could help the elderly people to to grow some food for the rest of the congregation. That would be a, a wonderful thing yeah. churches could do. Great idea. Yeah, good idea. Um, Judith. Um, so our church, our church had just got gold about two or three weeks ago. Oh, well done. Methodist church. <laughs> but we're, we, we've got to carry on doing lots more things. So I've got another meeting tomorrow to plan loads of things. So I dutifully told them all about the... Lent vigil at London, but nobody's going to go all the way down there. And if they did, they wouldn't be interested. The rest of the church, you know, anything that happens five miles beyond Settle isn't. <laughs> <laughs> and the main thing is, is difficulty about the tech, getting technical advice. And I think actually we are going to get somebody really we've got a big grant from somewhere, someone to come and look at the buildings and give us more advice because we've done all these common sense things like get the get the outside insulated and, and various things, but it's just so difficult to know to know what to do and if we do get this money to get the survey then we'll perhaps be given some, some good ideas going back to this vigil it, is it just in london or is it in different parts of the country as well just yeah just just london um yes it is just london i went to the big one last year and actually one thing i said i was going to t tell them all about the big one I never actually did, but when they came and interviewed us about the eco ward, they said, "Oh, did you have? Did you do your talk about the big one?" No, but I'm I'm going to. Mm -hmm. So I've got to make an effort to tell people because I've done all these things over years and years, and the church doesn't really know. Anybody else? I don't see any raised hands at the moment, except Judas, which you can put down. I'm sure in a I minute. Know. Thank you. It's just different, different, some ways of, of, of providing people with expertise as to what the best thing to do is, is a big yeah. part. Mm -hmm. I think there's so much to be said. I mean, going back to you know, like using people's gardens, which I've heard about before and then completely forgotten about and things like that. There are little things to do that are not threatening and not, mm. you know, and I think that's that's sort of the good thing is, is to persuade people. You can do some really useful things that are quite fun, not threatening, don't, in, you know, don't involve getting anywhere near arrested or anything like that or being a rat bag you know or anything that sort of thing so that's good to do um no right. sue and jim again so i just thought yeah ruth is there not with the vigil isn't there is there not a possibility of signing up to do it remotely online at the vigil there um no you're meant to go you're meant to go, but nearer the time, 
Um, I mean, you will be able to obviously use the prayer resources and everything from home. So, I mean, you could do that. But the idea is to get people there. That is the idea uh, for this particular thing we're doing. Um, but, uh, you know, I still think, you know, if one person can go from your church, the others can pray sort of at the same time where they are. You know, that's that's the sort of thinking. And then at least your church is participating in the activism, even if then the, most of them don't go, is, is what we're thinking. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sophie. Yes, coming back about the elderly people's gardens, that idea was developed, well, developed, thought of in Cheltenham or oh, a good 15 years ago, but mm -hmm. it transpired that because of insurance and all sorts of legal implications, it was far too complicated. Elderly people would not let you into their garden without a real contract and uh, people will want to work in the garden in case they get wounded. So, yeah, the idea is great, but it didn't work in Cheltenham because of the legal complications. Mm. So maybe a contract could be written by somebody nationally that could be used, that would be help. Mm -hmm. Because for the time being, I, you know, I know it was never started in Cheltenham because of the legal implications. But I like the idea. Mm, Other yeah. possibilities, of course, are using the churchyard, if you've got a churchyard, or even getting a church allotment. Mm. Yeah. Another yeah. another thing. Sorry, Sophie, you no, finished. Sorry, yeah. yeah. Um, that was just brought to my attention yesterday. We've got a very active lady in transition, Litchfield. Um, she's not involved with the churches, but she's just an amazing person who cross fertilizes her ideas across so many organisations and one of her plans for this year is that we have an open garden scheme, not neatly manicured gardens but gardens like mine where I've got fruit bushes and, and strawberries and goodness knows what rambling around my front garden mm -hmm. and that we actually publicise these and have a trail around Litchfield for people who are growing food. Um, for people to go and have a look. Thank you for that. Is anybody else? We've got a minute or two left. If there's sort of a last question, comment. All right. Well, I'll take that silence to mean that people are busy thinking. Certainly, been a lot to think about today. Um, so before we finish. Um, Barbara is just going to say something about the next uh, workshop in February. The next one's going to be totally different to anything we've tried before. Uh, it's going to be on haiku. It's a simple mm -hmm. form of poetry that expresses a lot in very few words. There's no right or wrong, except some general, not strict guidance on how many words to use. And Emma Major, who is a blind artist and poet, has written books on this, uh, caring for creation, um, into visionary paintings, poems, reflections, highlighting issues of climate justice, which she specialises in, and asking how can we bring about mm. positive change together. And uh, that was shown in the COP26 by Tear Fund. So Emma will be leading a workshop by talking first a little about what brought her into writing haiku, specifically on and with climate and environmental related subject matter. And she'll share some of her haiku. Now, prior, before the workshop, those signing up will be provided with some pointers for being creative with haiku. You might like to come prepared to the workshop. You might like to try a little haiku. You could bring it along and share with us in the breakout groups. And if that's not for you, but you find inspiration in others' poetry, you might like to bring a poem or psalm with you that speaks to you as you contemplate the climate and climate crisis and climate justice. Um, those who've done deep waters, you'll have plenty of material to choose from, be inspired by. And then after the breakout groups, those willing to share more can do so. And Emma will also read some more of her work. So it'll be relaxing, challenging, depending on which level you chose to go with and something very different to anything we've tried before. OK, mm -hmm. so I hope to see some of you here. Um, Graham, do you, um, David, do you want, shall I say the prayer first? And, and I think so, yes, just a second. I, I think it'll be a lot of fun. Okay. Um, 
And you can also just sit quietly through the whole thing and not say anything, but just enjoy Absolutely. everybody else's. There's no compulsion to, to perform. Correct. So Barbara, would you like to close in prayer? Close in prayer and then we'll say goodbye to Graham. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. let's just pray. This is adapted from a prayer by Green Christian member, Helen Burnett. Truth telling God, weave a thread of love and courage among those who stand for creation. May they know the sound of your voice in all they do. May your love echo across the streets of their cities and communities so that the sap of change can rise and seep into the corridors of power to bring the dawning of a new day where the web of life is sanctified, renewed and replenished. Lord, have mercy. Lord, Amen. Have mercy. Amen. Thank you, Barbara. And now to thank you, uh, to thank Graham very much for uh, a very full and inspiring uh, mm -hmm. talk that I think has given us a number of ideas to go away and think about how we can work uh, further with our churches and with organizations not related to the church, because that's obviously an important thread that ran through that. It was different groups working together. So thank you very much, Graham, for that very um, informative and inspiring uh, talk. <laughs>